I just want you to know I am sweating bullets up here because I embarrass my employees every day when I show up to work. <laughs> so we'll have to talk. All right. <laughs> no, one of the reasons I was asked uh, by Baki to be here is because they listen to their customers. And one of the things their customers are saying a lot right now is healthcare is killing me. These costs are just out of control. So my presentation today is primarily about healthcare costs, uh, how, how we can, uh, you know, some of the things that we need to be aware of as it pertains to healthcare costs. The, uh, just a little bit of an update on PPACA, PAPACA, healthcare reform, the Affordable Healthcare Act, whatever you want to call it. And then maybe just a little bit of a to-do list on what you need to be thinking about over the next 12 to 24 months on your health plan. So. Um, there's a reason why employers are worried. When you look at this slide, uh, health care costs in the last 10 years have gone up tremendously. And when, when you look at the, what effect that has on the employer's bottom line, it's amazing. And, and so this is getting, of course, national attention that we need help. We need help in controlling costs. When you look at health care costs, one of the things that you really have to look at is the consumer portion of health care costs. Our portion of what we pay for health care costs has actually gone down over the last 30 years, not up. I know that's hard for some people to believe. It's truly hard to believe, but when you look at an average health plan in 1970, we had a $200 deductible and 80-20 coinsurance. Can anybody remember that? Anybody remember that from 1970? It was just a straight major medical. There were no HMOs, no PPOs, no managed care component to our health plan. We had a $200 deductible. Anybody know how much it cost to have a baby in 1970? I was born after that, so. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone want to guess? Take a stab? Good job. Well done. It was $565 to have a baby in 1970. So if we had a $200 deductible and 80-20 coinsurance, we were paying about half of what it cost to have a baby. Now, when we just take a $200 deductible and increase it by inflation, just CPI, all right? I'm just talking CPI, not healthcare inflation. Healthcare inflation has averaged upwards of 7% per year for the last 30 years. CPI is under three. So if we just take the little CPI cal cal uh, calculator on the internet and we increase that deductible by CPI, the deductible today should be equivalent to $1,160. The out-of-pocket should be equivalent to $6,957. I can tell you, working in my business, there aren't a lot of employers that have out-of-pocket maximums on a single basis that are over $6,900. So as consumers, maybe we're not picking up our fair share of the cost, which puts pressure on premiums, doesn't it? Right? That's logical. So how much does it cost to have a baby today? Nine, twelve thousand dollars somewhere in there. Uh, maybe even higher for just a normal uh, vaginal delivery. When we look at this out-of-pocket cost, if, if we were up in that $6,000 range, we might be paying half of it, but we're not. So that's part of the problem. We put, we're putting pressures on uh, the, the uh, premium costs. But there's so many things that affect our healthcare costs that if it was one thing, it would be super easy to fix. fix. We could get government involved and, and, and fix it right away, couldn't we? But there are so many things that contribute to the cost of health care that it's really hard. We just don't have a silver bullet approach to fix this. Uh, there's things like uh, prescription drug costs. 30 years ago, for every dollar spent on health care, about four cents was paid out in prescription drug costs. Anybody know what that is today? How many cents on the dollar is spent on health care costs? Just for the prescription drug portion? It's about 20 cents on the dollar. So, so that, that alone is a huge contributor to the, the cost of providing care for our consumers. Uh, we've got legislation. Every time they legislate something or mandate something, that has a price tag associated with it and we pay more in insurance premium. We've got an aging population. Anybody heard of that thing called the baby boomer generation? That bubble <laughs> that's going through our system? Well, the top end of that bubble, it's arguable, but anywhere from 62 to 65 years old, right? 
Well, they're approaching the most expensive health care that they're going to incur in their entire lifetime, on average. When that bubble's going through our system and we've got a high demand on our health care, what do you think happens to price? It's e economics 101. When there's a high demand and a limited supply, what happens to price? So that, what, what would we expect to happen, right? Um, so th that has a big, uh, big contributing factor to across as well. Knowledge and demand, we've got access to phenomenal tools and resources. Pricing on providers, outcomes data. And what we have access to as consumers today is amazing. And what that does is it allows us to research our condition on WebMD or care lines or things that we can actually go online through, for example, VirtuWell, get a diagnosis online without even seeing a physician. Is that not cool? But it also makes you, you know, you tear out that, um, you tear out that, or you, you take that information from your computer and you go to the, your physician and you say, hey doc, this is what I have, treat me. I need, I need an EKG and a yada, 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 right? So now we've demanded healthcare that maybe the physician needs to step back and say, well, whoa, 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 wait a minute, we need to try a little bit more of a conservative approach to this before we jump into all those tests, right? So now that just opens up a whole new discussion. So that's a good thing, but it comes with a price tag. And then of course we've got professional facility charges going up uh, and every time their charges go up, that that's, it directly impacts us as consumers. And then lifestyle issues. When we look at all those things on that pizza pie slice, that lifestyle issues is the one thing that I can honestly say we all individually have control over. And until we as citizens of the United States take more responsibility on our own health and wellness, we're not gonna see an end to these increasing costs. And I'm, I'm very passionate about that. When we look at the choices we make, whether, we, whether or not we use tobacco, whether or not we use drugs or alcohol, whether or not we stay within our height and weight range, a normal height and weight range, get exercise daily, those are all things that directly impact our own health. And we have a whole bunch of people that aren't making that a priority in their lives. I'm gonna have you take a look at these slides. I don't have a pointer, but see down here, I'm sorry, I'm gonna step away from the podium for just a minute. <laughs> you look down here. I want, I'm gonna go through these very quickly, but I want you to check this out. This is obesity trends in the US dating back to 1986, and obesity as defined by somebody that has a BMI of a over 30 or is 30 pounds overweight for a five foot four person. So check out these colors as I flip through these slides and see how this has changed in the last 30 years. This is 2000. This is 2005. It gets really ugly. Ugh. That's awful, isn't it? So in our great state of Wisconsin, 25 to 29% of the residents in our state are considered obese. That's an epidemic, all right? So when we look at controlling healthcare costs, we look at the pie, right? And we look at a pie chart. For every dollar we spend on in health insurance premium, about 85 cents of that goes out to pay claims, and 15 cents of that is administrative costs, on average, all right? So when we're looking at controlling costs, we have to be looking at the big picture to say, most definitely we need to focus on that 15% a little bit because there's, a, there's room to give in there, okay? We need to focus on those administrative costs and saving money there. But we're gonna have a much higher impact if we focus some time on that 85% of controlling those claims and staying well so that we can make a difference from people going uh, from, people going from an average health to a great health versus an average health to a poor health. That's the importance of wellness. And it really helps us control our costs over a multi-year period. But instead, we've got healthcare reform. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and And what healthcare reform was meant to do is help us with costs a little bit, right? But more so what it's done is it's helped give people access to health insurance. So it's really helped with accessibility. There are parts of the healthcare reform bill that do address affordability, but far, far, far more of the reform bill is about accessibility, not affordability. 
There's a lot of things happening behind the scenes, folks, on health care reform that uh, people, it's not even uh, coming, coming to a, um, in the, the media's attention. There's a lot of really, really good, smart people focusing on controlling costs, you guys. Uh, very, very um, innovative things happening behind the scenes to try to help with uh, efficiencies in improving health care. But right now, when we look at health care reform, uh, there's the big question is, is, is it going away, right? Uh, the, there's a very big uh, question as to whether or not health care reform is going to be considered constitutional. So there's a lot of things that are, that are floating around and things that are coming that you need to be aware of and be prepared for. But um, there's still the big question, is it going away? We've already um, seen some legislation that has been repealed, the uh, repeal of vouchers and the 1099 repeal. Uh, and then there's other areas that are being considered to be repealed because they've actually escalated costs instead of saved costs in areas. Uh, but you know that, that, that's the big question of the day. So some things that I can tell you for sure is uh, that the non-discrimination testing part of the PAPACA bill is uh, delayed. Let's just say delayed. It may be, go away uh, totally, but right now it's delayed. And, the non-discrimination part of the bill says that if, you have, if you're an employer and you have two different health plans or maybe you pay 100% of the premium on one set of employees and 80% on another set of employees, according to the health care reform bill, that is discriminatory and you can no longer do that. That was supposed to be in effect last year. It is delayed. Uh, we, so until, until we know further, that's where we're at with uh, discrimination testing. Uh, we've also got the W-2 reporting. That is effective this year. And for an employer that has over 250 W-2s, they are now required to report the full cost of health care, not the employer portion, the full cost of health care on their W-2s annually. Anybody under 250 employees, it's optional. Uh, and, and it may eventually be required, but right now it's optional. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the mandates that will be coming. I'm going to do this by year, but one of the things that you'll see on these slides, I'm going to whip through them very, very fast, but you'll see some to-do lists for you or some suggestions on things that you're going to want to talk to your advisor about as you plan for 2014 and beyond. One of them is this comparative effectiveness researches, research feed. This is effective this year, folks. You'll be paying you or your health carrier or your employees or a combination of both. We're still waiting for guidance as to how this is going to be collected, but you will have to pay $1 as of October 1st renewals and beyond. You'll have to pay $1 per member per month uh, to pay for this comparative effectiveness research fee. Next year, it goes up to $2. Uh, in 2013, one of the things that you're going to want to make sure that your plan complies with is the FSA cap. FSA stands for Flexible Spending Account. When you have a flexible spending account, that's the account that allows your employees to pay their premiums with pre-tax dollars. It allows them to pay their uninsured medical expenses with pre-tax dollars and their dependent daycare. Those are three separate accounts in an FSA. That, that middle account, the uninsured medical expense account, has got to be limited to $2,500. Now, if your health, your health plan, or I'm sorry, your flex plan year runs something other than January to December, you may need to change your, uh, your flex plan limit to $2,500 this year because your plan would run on a plan year. Something you're definitely going to want to be talking to your benefit advisor about to make sure that your plan is in compliance in preparation for 2013. Um, 2013, we're going to have the new hospital insurance tax or new Medicare payroll tax. This applies to your workers that, oops, did I not, sorry. Flipping through. <laughs> All right, this uh, Medicare tax. Oh, did I? I'm sorry, I, I skipped one. So, the employer notice requirement in 2013. As of March of 2013, you're going to be required to notify your employees that there's going to be an exchange in 2014. There'll be very, very specific notice requirements. All of this, of course, is contingent on the fact that um, healthcare reform stays as is. Uh, we're going to have the, the payroll tax, the Medicare payroll tax that's coming. That applies to your workers that are making over $200,000 if they're filing as an individual, $250,000 if they're filing jointly. Uh, anybody see any problem with that? Yeah. <laughs> Joanne said it. 
how would I know what my employees' household income is? How are they, how are they, gonna, how are they gonna have employers comply with this? Oh, sorry, you gotta bring me your tax return so I know whether I'm gonna. <laughs> Will you show me your tax return? Because I gotta know. <laughs> That'd be a little awkward. So I, they don't know. It, it, this may be, again, something that's repealed or, or they may just say anybody that any earner, wage earner, that's over $200,000 in, in wages from your specific company, it, the, the, point nine, the extra 0.9% will come from. And then, of course, there's also an additional 3.8% tax on investment income. So in 2014, this is when the rubber hits the road with health care reform. You're really good, your to-do is really to think about your enrollment strategies. There will be no pre-existing condition allowed and no and um, guarantee issue required. This is the pay or play, uh, pay or play mandate where an employee, th this is the part of the health care reform bill that's really getting um, a lot of attention because it's the individual mandate. Where the, the, as individuals in our country, as of January of 2014, we will be required to purchase health insurance. Required. It'll be the law. And if we don't, we will be penalized. The penalty is under 200 bucks a year. Yeehaw, <laughs> right? So I'll waive the insurance. My, my employer makes me pay over 200 bucks a month for my health insurance. Why would I, why would I why, what would stop me from waiving my employer's health insurance and going uninsured? Because if I get sick, I'll just hop on at open enrollment. There's no pre-existing condition, right? So we got a bunch, of, so, so do you think that this is gonna help uninsured percentage in our, popu in our population or hurt it? You know, so big, big question of the day. Uh, and so either they have to do something about the, the size of that penalty to disincent people, or they're going to uh, take away the individual mandate altogether. But with that said, what we're advising our clients to do is really think about your enrollment strategies today and into the future. There are state laws that govern enrollment strategy, your, your enrollment, there are, there are I, I wasn't able to connect with the OCI before the meeting today to find out if Wisconsin um, does have open enrollment rules. I can follow up through Adam on this or Becky Norman be able to get that out to you once I'm able to connect, but there are employers, I can imagine, that will say no more open enrollment. If you don't take the coverage when you're first hired at my company, you'll never be able to get on, period. So either you take it on, take it now, or you're not going to get it. So if that's legal in your state, that would be something that a lot of employers are going to be looking at. Another thing employers are looking at is they're saying, I'm going self-funded. <laughs> you know, I got 60 employees. I know that's a lot of risk, but I am definitely going self-funded because when you have a self-funded plan, you don't have to comply with state law. Your plan is governed by ERISA. So those are some things that you're going to want to talk with benefit counsel, benefit advisor to see, to see if that is the right thing for you. Um, so the other question of the day is, as an, as an employer, should I, should I provide coverage or not? You know, what, what, what's going to motivate me to provide coverage when employees can purchase coverage through an exchange or, you know, um, what, what's going to incent me to do that? Well, just so that you know, Massachusetts has had this in place since 2000, what was it? Help me, I can't remember the year. Is it six, 2006, 2005, something like that? And in Massachusetts, they have an individual mandate, okay? If you don't participate in, in, a, in, a, in a, either an employer-sponsored plan or have individual coverage, you are required, you, you will get penalized. You're gonna get, you pay an extra amount on your federal, ta or your state tax return every year. That is part, that, this is the reform that um, the national health care reform was modeled after. What do you think happened to the uninsured population in Massachusetts? Did it go up or down? Anybody? Neither. Neither. It actually went down. It went from a, a uninsured population from about uh, of about nine percent to an uninsured population of about seven percent. So they gained two percentage points by implementing that law. law but there's still seven percent of the population that's uninsured. Do you think employers still offer health care in Massachusetts? Nobody dropped their health plan. There were no employers that dropped it because they all have to compete against each other and they all need to provide benefits for their people. So that's what happened there. I would expect that that will be what happens uh, moving forward on a national basis if this goes through.
but it will be very important to look into the, take into consideration your budget and what you, what, what you can afford, what you're going to do moving forward with that. Uh, if your plan is deemed unaffordable, which unaffordable, according to PAPACA, is uh, premiums that exceed 9.5% of the household income. Again, how are you going to know what the household income is? Right? <laughs> but uh, if, if there are premiums that the employee pays exceed that, uh, there will be a penalty, which will be equivalent to the lesser of $3,000 for each full-time employee receiving federal assistance or $2,000 multiplied by all full-time employees. So something to think about, because if you start doing those calculations now, again, how do you know what household income is? But if you start doing those calculations now and your premiums are deemed unaffordable, do you want to take that big jump in 2014, or do you want to start looking at that now and gradually move into it? Kind of a budget, budgetary thing that you're going to want to look into. And then finally, uh, a couple more things. Uh, we've got automatic enrollment in 2014 where employers with more than 200 employees are going to be required to automatically enroll you unless you opt out as a new hire. And then we've got the exchanges in 2014, which very recent in the state of Wisconsin, Governor Walker, uh, um, well, Governor Doyle committed to be an early adopter in the state of Wisconsin for exchanges. And uh, they, they, they went full speed ahead. Uh, Wisconsin's a leader in the healthcare exchange. They're, they're um, leaning heavily on a um, private sector type exchange where it will allow the free market to continue to compete, which would mean, which would mean lower premiums for everybody, ultimately. And just recently, Governor Walker did put that project on hold. We, we were um, set for receiving $37 million in funding at the state level to help uh, with that, uh, to develop the exchange. We've spent, I believe, $3 million of that. Uh, we don't have $37 million in our budget right now from the, from the federal government. They, it wasn't all just dumped into our checking account. <laughs> right? We had to meet certain guidelines, certain, certain um, benchmarks to be able to receive a certain portion of the dollars. We've spent $3 million the 37 million is on, basically Governor Walker said, I'm not spending any more money until we know that this is constitutional. So the good side of this is that we're not spending extra time and resources and money on something that may or, not, may or, may or may not be constitutional. The bad side of this is if it is deemed constitutional and we need to go full speed ahead, we've got a very short window, don't we? So that's what's going on in the state government right now with exchanges. That's all I have. Hopefully you'll be uh, ready <laughs> in 2014 armored with what you need to know in 2014. Thank you. <laughs>